Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, hey, Kevin. It's a delight to be here with such luminaries. Uh, the opioid crisis and the commission report, can marijuana be a solution? I'd like just to give a shout out to uh, Paul Larkin, who's sitting in the back, because he helped um, really establish the, um, the report in which I'm going to describe to some extent. Yeah, I think you have to be in the presentation. Right? No, the presentation mode is killing it. It's going to be killing it. Just <laughs> so, the um, ancient Greeks had a term called pharmacone. And pharmacone means a poison and a medicine. And I don't think there's a more apt term that we can apply to opioids. There's no other drug, I think, that fulfills this to such a, a, an accurate extent. And the reason is that it can produce both pleasure and pain. And both pleasure and pain is regulated by the opioid system in our brains. Pain is the number one reported medical reason for using abusable drugs and because the pleasure and pain centers are linked. It makes an awful lot of sense that if you're going to dampen pain, there's also the possibility of overshooting and increasing your pleasurable state. From 1900 on, most accidental deaths in our country declined. And the deaths due to falls, the deaths due to fires, the deaths due to drownings, the deaths due to poison gas, all of them fell dramatically over a hundred years. The only one that hasn't is the death due to drugs. And that has risen dramatically in the past 15, 20 years or so. And we've already seen the slide showing that the greatest cause of overdose deaths now is fentanyl followed by heroin, prescription opioids, cocaine, and methamphetamine. So today, what I'm going to try to summarize in five seconds is the opioid crisis and the root causes. Why is, are the root causes so important? There are two motivations for going after these root causes. One is to try to understand how our country got into this mess in order to reverse engineer the mess because there's certain things we can take steps to reverse, which we, in, and, and to take those steps, we have to understand what they are. And secondly, the mess we're in with opioids has many parallels with marijuana. And it's very interesting to look at the strategies and tactics that were used in terms of advancing the use of opioids and see whether or not they're applicable to marijuana as well. I'll quickly go through the opioid recommendations, the opioid commission recommendations, a bit of marijuana pain, and then finally close with can marijuana substitute for pain. Let's take a look at the root causes. How many in this room are aware that we have a terrible opioid addiction problem in our nation 200 years ago? Anyone? A few. Not many. The majority of people who were addicted were women after the Civil War. Men ramped up the problem as well because of the injectable morphine that was developed. But what was so interesting is that in the austere and revered New England Journal of Medicine, which is a paragon of, of medical journalism, in 1823 and 1825, there were two articles written by physicians, one of which tried to surmount an overdose by developing a, a hose that could go into the stomach and suck out the contents of opioids, morphine, laudanum, opium juice. So we knew 200 years ago that this drug class can kill you. And another physician, tried to surmount the overdose crisis, the, the overdose um, treachery, by giving vinegar, acetic acid, to make a person vomit the contents of their stomach. So for over 100 years, the medical community knew 
that opioids are, addiction, are addictive, they can cause overdose, and there was no evidence for their use in chronic pain. In fact, the evidence was the reverse, that it's malevolent because so many people became addicted to morphine. And then what happened? In the same revered New England Journal of Medicine, fast forward now to 1980, there was a five-sentence letter to the editor saying addiction is rare in patients treated with narcotics. And they said they conclude, despite widespread use of narcotics in hospitals, it's rare. Now, I gave this five-sentence letter on this slide to first-year Harvard Medical School students just a few months ago. And I said, I'm going to do a cold call on you. You tell me what's wrong with this. And in five minutes, they had all the weaknesses of this five-sentence letter. But what they didn't know was that after this was published in 1980, the letter garnered 600 citations in the biomedical journal. 600. Yeah. Letters usually get no more than 10, which meant a whole group of people publishing in medical journals were affirming the conclusions, because most of the conclusions, the evidence was weak and the pressure was on. Shifting the blame of pain to physicians, there were two very large lawsuits that were well publicized. A patient movement began, the tragedy of needless pain, the pharmaceutical industry put in millions upon millions of dollars to so-called educate pain societies, patient advocacy groups, <clears throat> and medical societies on how opioids are effective and safe for the treatment of chronic pain. And that little, that little letter helped to catalyze, because there was the evidence. This is New England Journal of Medicine. Doctors were... Um, Sent, were, were visited by detailers, by marketing men. The Veterans Administration adopted pain as the fifth vital sign. The Joint Commission that accredits healthcare organizations followed suit, and soon the pressure was on physicians. Assess pain, treat pain aggressively to the satisfaction of pain, patients. Otherwise, you may lose your accreditation and your reimbursement. And then, the cartels noticed, and they started to produce heroin at much higher purity and at a much lower price. And so when prescriptions started to tighten, when tamper-resistant tamper medications were developed in a subpopulation of people, we saw a shift to heroin and to illicit market drugs. With the advent of fentanyl, which started in 2013, this is a two kilogram, at one kilogram, it's 2.2 pounds of fentanyl, can kill a half a million people. This is the size of a two kilogram box of sugar. We had a perfect storm. And so the President's Commission was formed with three governors, an Attorney General, former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, and this little old lady who bought four-inch heels to try to elevate her status in the committee. But in any case, uh, Governor Christie asked me to shepherd the report. And the commission response looked at every single phase of this problem, from prevention, which includes supply reduction, to risk factors, how people initiate, escalate, how they overdose, how they develop an opioid use disorder, withdrawal, relapse, and all that, and the impact on families and children, on people in the criminal justice system, on college campuses. 56 recommendations emerged from it, which included broad brushstrokes of prevention, recovery, treatment, rescue, research, who would do it, and accountability. And these are some of the topics in terms of federal funding, removing treatment barriers. And, of course, when I studied the history in depth, reverse engineering some of the folly, the mishaps in the healthcare community. And all of these, there are about 36 recommendations 
that our efforts to reverse engineer the root causes of this. The commission report included solutions for treatment, which you've heard enough about, but we did include data analytics, which is critical, uh, research as well. And, um, and then we get to the nexus between marijuana and opioids. And we'll go through this very quickly. George Washington died of a terrible, terrible um, infection. He was bled, half his blood volume, and it probably accelerated his demise. And the reason he was bled half his blood volume is that there were no randomized controlled trials that were objective, evidence-based, to determine a bloodletting, which had been going on for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians, ancient Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, the Middle Ages, everyone d decided that if you want to treat someone, you just drain their blood out of them, because the blood is the root cause of these problems. So randomized controlled trials have become the gold standard of how you assess medications. And if you look at the indications for marijuana as a medicine in these states, Illinois is by far the poster child for it, these have no randomized controlled trials for smoked marijuana, with the exception of neuropathic pain and a study on multiple sclerosis. Somehow we have taken that step backwards to the time of George Washington. So there are rationales for using marijuana in the opioid crisis. Cannabinoids in the plant have been approved by the FDA. There's CB1 cannabinoid receptors distributed in brain regions associated with pain processing. Smoke marijuana and some randomized controlled trials show pain reduction, largely neuropathic pain. There are four studies that, with small groups, so there's lots of weaknesses in those studies and that marijuana is safer than opioids, and that marijuana will rescue our country. What's the rationale against using marijuana? Is it a safe and effective analgesic? Do states with legal or medical marijuana have lower op opioid overdose rates? Do users of marijuana for pain use less opioids? Does marijuana use interfere with treatment? for opioid use disorder. And what does the preclinical research tell us? The evidence for marijuana as an analgesic in neuropathic pain, which is one subtype of pain. There are many different types of pain. There's many different degrees of pain. And there's psychogenic pain. There's so many that we can discuss. I had a whole slide on pain. And I said, Kevin will take the hook on me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what we know is that the concentration of marijuana is not fixed. The ratio of THC to CBD is not uniform. It's not been tested adequately in various forms of pain, and especially in chronic pain. Those randomized controlled trials, none of them lasted more than a couple of weeks. Same set, same situation we had with opioids. At the time that I was worried about opioids in 2006, I looked at the literature. We had nothing past a few months, no data. And it's not tested for chronic pain over months, not tested in terms of its effect on quality of life, daily living, cognitive, uh, cognitive function, etc. And the amazing thing is that THC and cannabidiol differ so markedly in terms of their pharmacological effects. One is addictive, the other is not. One intoxicates, the other is not. One impairs cognition, the other does not. One induces anxiety, the other does not. One is psychotomimetic, means it can induce psychosis, the other does not. One can be pro-convulsant or anti-convulsant, the other is largely anti-convulsant. The receptors, the targets in the brain are quite different. And yet, the ratio of THC to CBD has gone up to 80 to 1 now. From 1 to 1, 3 to 1, 10 to 1. So the plan form has none of the criteria that are used to improve a medicine. There's no standard dosing, 
marijuana is not benign. Is it safe as an analgesic? Brain changes, addiction, cognitive deficits, amotivation, psychosis, and safety. All of these issues have a good solid base in terms of evidence behind them. That doesn't mean everyone is going to have these issues, but there is a vulnerability in some individuals that marijuana can precipitate. The prevalence of cannabis use disorder is somewhere between 11 and 30 percent. Wilson Compton says one death is seen says 30 percent. Youth marijuana use is associated with use, much higher use of illicit drugs, and the latest is that this is from NISDA data that it, heavy users of marijuana in the 12 to 17 year old range are 10 times more likely to misuse opioids. They're also much more likely to have depression and these increases in risk it also include the 18 to 25 year olds. Overdose death rates increase dramatically in states that legalize marijuana. And what we have now is that states that have legalized or medicalized overdose deaths are 56% higher than states that have not touched the drug. Do users of marijuana for pain use fewer opioids? We've already seen some of the data, so I won't perseverate. Does marijuana use interfere with treatment for opioid use disorder? There's some evidence for that. What does the preclinical data tell us? Sometimes animal studies can give us insights that are unethical to conduct in humans. In humans, we know that young adolescent marijuana users use heroin and other drugs more. That data is pretty uh, incontrovertible. Rodent adolescents exposed to THC seek heroin more avidly. Rodents exposed to THC in utero, when they grow up, they seek heroin more avidly, and their behavioral and brain structure and molecular biology is different. And future parents exposed to THC long before conception, long before pregnancy. They have, they seek heroin more compulsively, they have more heroin withdrawal, and they also show brain and behavioral changes. I won't get into this because the hook is on the way. And I will just say, then it was over the commission report, we learned vast sums of money were spent to promote the opioids, same thing with marijuana. Promoted for medical, many medical conditions, same for marijuana. Promoted as safe and non-addictive, same for marijuana. No scientific evidence for chronic use, same <coughs> for marijuana. Advocates received attention, but opponents did not. Advocates were far more vocal. Addiction and diversion were not anticipated. High potency drugs flooded the nation and medical education lagged far behind. And government regulations failed to protect the public. The movement is parallel with marijuana. And I'm just closing. I'd like to say we've seen Prince Parrish, we've seen Michael Jackson. Many of these have succumbed to opioids. Entertainers, we lament, the media laments. But alas, for those who never sing and die with all the music in them, weep for the voiceless who have known the cross without the crown of glory. Thank you.